Hello and welcome to episode 28 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my life stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret – never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician, Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. And my guest this week is the fabulous New York City-based singer-songwriter, Jeff Slate. Not only an internationally recognised recording artist and music journalist, but from the discovery of the jam in the 70s to the love of the Style Council and the first moments of Paul Weller solo right up to now, Jeff has been there as a super fan, a collector, a master interviewer, and so much more. Plus, Jeff has also got his copy of Fat Pop Volume 1. So stand by for news on what Jeff calls the best moments of the past five or so records. Now, if you've yet to come across Jeff's music, you are missing out. He co-founded the band The Mindless Thinkers in the 1980s, founded The Badge in the 90s, and has performed and worked with countless rock luminaries, including Pete Townsend of The Who, Roger McGuinn of The Birds, Sheryl Crow, and many, many more. In fact, last year, he released a brand new single called Heartbreak, which was recorded during lockdown with the likes of Earl Slick, his longtime collaborator. He's a guy who'd worked with John Lennon, David Bowie, Dolph McKagan, Guns N' Roses on bass, and Paul Weller's longtime drummer, Ben Gordelia. I hope I pronounced that right. He's also working with Andy Crofts and Steve Craddock right now. And as a music journalist, Jeff writes feature articles and conducts in-depth interviews for the likes of Rock Seller, Rolling Stones Magazine, Esquire, The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, NBC, and so much more. This is one of my favorite episodes so far. I hope you enjoy. Let's cross to New York. Absolutely. Anytime. This is great. I love crossing the Atlantic for this. So we find you right now in New York. Yes. Surrounded by records of Mr. Weller from the Jam, the Star Council and the solo years. You're a super fan. I'm a super fan. I was thinking about this. You know, I have, you know, I've framed portraits of some of my favorite people here and a couple of gold records and things like that, things I've worked on. And I have one portrait of the Beatles, one of Dylan, a couple of other random ones, but I have three, if you count, I have a jam era photo of him live, a, a solo era portrait over there, and a jam, you know, it's like I have three of him. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, it boggles, oh, I got just drummer over here, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's like his career has in so many ways soundtracked our lives. So it's like if it had just been the jam, I would still be a deep, deep, serious fan. But then, you know, and that was sort of my teen years. And then the Style Council was sort of the college years. And then, you know, the solo years, which I picked up on before the record, the first record even came out. And, and then our paths started to cross. So, you know, when you meet somebody that you really idolized, who really inspired you, especially as a musician uh, early on, and you realize they're flesh and blood, but also more than you imagined they were going to be. A lot of the people I know, I've gotten to know, I disassociate from their work. But I don't know them well enough to have done that, but it never ceases to amaze me the amount of work, but the, the level of quality consistent across his career, which is unlike anybody, especially from that era of music, from the, yeah, the yeah. sort of punk class. When did you first discover the music of the jam then? And, and which song was it? Can you remember? And, and what did it sure. mean? Uh, so it's, it's actually such a great story too. I was, I was in a band, I was about 12 or 13 years old, and it was this little punky band. I mean, I'm trying to think maybe 79-ish, 79 or 80, uh, with a couple of older kids, you know, just playing songs in a basement. My breakfast sort of began and ended with the Beatles at that point. A lot of my friends were like Kiss fans and Eagles fans and, you know, things like that, and which none of that moved me at all. And I knew the Who because my brother was a Who fan. And I knew other, you know, my brother was a little bit older, so he had Dylan and the Beatles and, you know, Zeppelin and, you know, so all the big, you know, the dinosaurs. But I knew the Who sort of Tommy and after that. And so this guy in, in my band gave me a, one rehearsal. The Kids Are All Right soundtrack album, My Generation by The Who, There Are But Four Small Faces and Setting Suns, and said, I think you'll like these. <laughs> and it changed my life. Wow. You know, I mean, it really changed my life. It was, it's funny because those albums, they're so different and they're not even necessarily the best of those bands but it was so exciting to me to find because i had grown up my my brother-in-law was a, a jazz session guy and had a really great record collection 
And he would have to sort of learn these songs that were, you know, I, I'd inherited a lot of records that were Isley Brothers and Isaac Hayes and Ray Charles and things like that. I had a great record collection as a kid. You know, American music, particularly at that point in the late 70s, there wasn't a lot of soul in it. You know, if you wanted soul, you got a soul record. Curtis Mayfield was a big one. And what I loved about the rhythm sections in, in all those bands was they were so obviously R&B influenced. You know, to a lay person, they might not appreciate Keith Moon as an R&B drummer, but I, there's so much swing. You know, and I played with American drummers and I played with mostly English drummers. And there's just something in the water over there. They, they swing in a way. Americans are very straight players by and large, whereas the English drummers swing. So those records drew me in, first of all, because they had that kind of vibe. The playing was just so outrageously like electric. And then, you know, the songs on all of them were just, you know, sort of blew me away. And and the Who Sings My Generation, which is what it's called over here, is, you know, it's sort of like the Beatles' first record. It's like half and half covers and, you know, whatever. I mean, it's just such an, and the cover is so cool. And, you know, there's yeah. so many things about it. The thing about setting suns, and I quickly got sound effects because I, I think it was new, you know, sort of at that time, which is kind of a cool thing to think. This was an album, you know, sort of like The Clash with London Calling. They were no longer a punk band. You know, they weren't really a punk band anymore, and they never were. We can talk about that with setting suns, but they really weren't a punk band anymore with sound effects. And then I got All Mod Cons, which is different, slightly different here. There's a slightly different track order. So then I had to get the import. I mean, I became <laughs> obsessed. Really? Well, b because here's the thing. So, you know, the Who were already on a victory lap. I saw them around that time when, when Kenny Jones first joined the band. And, you know, it was a big stadium rock show, a big arena rock show. And the Small Faces obviously were not around. I mean, you know, Steve Marriott was still touring in like packet of three or something, you know, but it wasn't, it really wasn't the small faces, but the jam were a current band. And it, it was like, you know, I, I discovered around that same time, uh, scary monsters and, and London calling and the clash records and so forth. My sister was a Bowie fan. So that was pretty easy to get a hand on. You know, these were people who were contemporary artists. They belonged to us and I didn't care. It didn't matter that the jam were not really covered in the American press, which is all we had back then, because none of these bands were accessible to us. We didn't have MTV. We didn't have, you know, they would get like maybe a mention in Rolling Stone occasionally if there was something new coming out or a tour or whatever. I remember seeing tour dates in Rolling Stone, being excited just that they were in the back page listed. You know, it was like they, <laughs> but they were, they were a contemporary band and, and they were not that much older. Paul was a teen at the time. So we played or attempted to play a lot of those songs. And, you know, once you do that, you're hooked. You know, those songs belong to you, especially when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, trying to find your way as a musician or a fan or whatever it is, a combination of the two. They belong to you in such a way. They're so ingrained in your DNA that I think you never let go of that. You know, and so then to have this sort of long relationship with both his career and him personally has, you know, sort of upped that ante dramatically. But anyway, but we're jumping ahead 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> you said, did you get to see the jam live? I will tell you a great story about that. But I will say also here we had that black EP as a 12 inch EP for, with absolute beginners and tales from the riverbank of that. And that was really important to me because it had a, a more open sound than Setting Sun. Setting Sun's was a very tight sound, and all my cons too. It had a more sort of 60s elegiac sound to it, but was also poppier than, than sound effects in a lot of ways, you know? So, so that was a really important one. So on the 82 tour, they were playing Boston, the Orpheum, which is a small place. I mean, I've seen many acts there since. I saw The Clash there and Oasis there. And, and my brother was supposed to take me. I was, I was pretty young. You know, I was, I'd seen The Clash at this point and the, the Kinks and a couple of other acts. But there was some drama over school or grades or I don't know what it was. My brother was going to take me and I wasn't allowed to go. <laughs> and and the, the worst, I'll tell you the worst thing about it was the gig was broadcast on the radio. So I heard 
live oh, as it happened, <laughs> the gig I was not allowed to go to. And the thing you focus on when that's, that's happening to you is in between the songs, the crowd was like, you know, you could feel it swaying and kind of, you know, the it was just such a yobbish crowd. You know, you could just hear it happening. And I I was so soul crushed that and I have a good style council story too. We hitchhiked, we hitchhiked to see the style council here in New York in uh eighty-four and I think made it like the gig had already started or whatever and could not get in. It's a really small, it was a really small gig. Right. And you know, they were so not a thing here that I don't even remember. We thought there'd be scalpers. There were no scalpers. <laughs> you know, like nobody cared about this gig. <laughs> so it was, that was, that was a, another depressing thing. So anyway, but, I, but again, I'm jumping ahead. It's just, I haven't talked, you know, I, I do a lot of interviews and they're all sort of the same. They're either about my career or, you know, Bob Dylan or the Beatles. So this is sort of all, this is like the Oasis podcast. This is what, uh, yeah. You know, we're kind of, you know, we're, we've taken a left turn into another, an unexplored territory. Yeah, that must have been, I mean, heartbreaking, like you say, listening to the to the gig on the radio that you couldn't get to and hearing I own, Simon. I <laughs> own that, you know, I have a silver disc and I have the MP3s and I have upgraded, I have the pre-FM, I have, I listened to that gig and in my mind I was there. Yeah, yeah. You know, because it was such a, semi, you know, I was, I guess, 15. I just turned 15 and was in a band and we were a working band. You know, we were playing like parties and, and things like that. Maybe a couple of bars here and there when they'd let us. This is what I was going to do. And they were my band. Mm -hmm. You know, the Clash and the Jam were my bands. You know, we were able to see when the Pistols split up, they they toured, I can't remember the name, the band without Johnny. And they played my hometown, this shitty little club in, in my hometown. And we snuck in and uh, and Jonesy's actually a really good friend of mine now. I, I, I met him in a, a couple of years later. But, you know, like I'd seen The Clash, I'd seen a version of The Pistols, you know, like it, it was just so soul crushing. Yeah. And I'd seen The Who, you know, and The Kinks. These were like the big loomings hugely in my formative teen obsessed mind, you know, mod obsessed mind. People who have known me a really long time. Like, I don't dress any differently now than I did when I was 15 years old. It's like the, you know, the pegged black pants and the, it's like, it's a, I've got a Kinks t-shirt on now. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's crazy. It's, it, it hasn't changed because that was such a, a key time. To, so to have not seen them and to have met so many people, you know, I've met all three guys, met a bunch of people who were involved, met John Paul's dad and Kenny Wheeler, all these people in that circle. And to think, how did I miss this by like 75 miles away? You know, yeah. so I, I so let's move on because I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, I feel I feel that it's apt that you're on a couch because I feel that this is like a, a therapy session for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this, this is my this is my interview spot, but you're probably <laughs> right. It's you know I I find that's funny that's really funny, but it's true because I think any any of these podcasts we do the the way to make them entertaining is to be as open as you can, yeah. and it does become a form of therapy. You yeah, know, totally, but absolutely. this is definitely <laughs> and and this is not a story like I was saying before. It's not a story I've told a million times. People don't ask an American about the jam all that often. You know, I've worked on, Pete Wilkie did a book a couple of years ago and I did a thing, you know, called American Mod for it. And I, I worked on a small faces box set many years ago and I knew those guys pretty well. And, but as an American, this is not part of, and even if you do talk about it, the people who are sort of into it aren't into the mod culture at all. They're, they're into it as, you know, they're, they're pop records to them or they're sort of this early weird incarnation of the who. I mean, musicians know who the small faces were, but even then, many of them confuse them with the faces, yeah. you know, yeah. and they're yeah. just such yeah. different animals in so many respects. We're going to zigzag across your career as well. So obviously you've mentioned the musician and you, and we'll talk about that, but also the journalist in you, the New York uh, Esquire Rolling Stone magazine. So I'm going to, at different points here, dip into that because subsequently you have interviewed Rick and Bruce. You've obviously talked to Paul. And if we were to focus on the jam... What is it that you think makes that band still stand up now and leave behind such an important legacy for fans like yourself, but such a huge fan base here in the UK as well? The songs. 
it begins and ends with the songs. No disrespect to Rick and Bruce because they made those records what they were. You know, they they made them electric and engaging and different. You know, they're incredibly unique. But without those songs, you just look at the first two records. Paul had, in many respects, and he will say this, sort of run out of steam with the second record. Now, I like the second record a lot. It has some great songs on it. But you can tell he was flagging. And, and the whole story about how he wrote some tunes for Ahmad Khan's and he went into the story and they were like, no, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And he really upped his game. And he was distracted. You know, he was in the grind of album tour, album tour. He had a girlfriend. He had, you know, life had sort of entered the picture. But he really made a decision to become a craftsman. And I think if you put the Jams records up against any of the bands from that time. And there are some great bands. The songs are what sets them apart. They were hit records. Even the songs that weren't singles are songs that certainly when I've traveled around Europe and England, every, you know, they come on a jukebox and everybody knows them. In the 90s, when we had the jukebox with CDs on them, you know, and you get the sort of deep tracks in a pub when I lived there, everybody knew every note of those songs. That's not... And again, I, you know, I, I, they wouldn't be the jam without the camaraderie and syncopation of Rick and Bruce, you know, the, the artistry that they brought to what they did. But it's those songs and the delivery. You know, Paul has such a unique voice, not just as a writer, but as a as a singer. Back in those days, I remember seeing him on the first solo tour and he'd sort of found this other voice. You know, he'd become this great singer over the course of the Style Council years. But what you get in those early years is a guy singing those songs that he he really means it. It's like it's like Dylan in his best shows. He believes what he's saying a hundred percent. And it's as though when he steps up to that microphone, he's never said any of it before. You know, it's like it's new and fresh. And so, you know, how can you not love that? And that's why, you know, again, all due respect to like the Buzzcocks or whoever who, you know, made some great records. This is another level. When you can attain that sort of dominance in the record business as ostensibly, you know, a quote unquote punk band, but become number one time after time after time, there's something else going on than just being flavor of the month. And again, those guys as a unit were remarkable, but so were a lot of other bands at that time. So what sets them apart is those records. And the proof is with very, very, very few exceptions, and I actually can't think of any now, Paul has remained, you know, there's not just quantity to what he's done, because a lot of artists have kept going, the level at which he works. I mean, he's very demanding of himself. You talk to himself, and he'll pick apart any record you put in front of him. He will pick it apart. I think that's crazy, because they're, you know, they're better than just about anything else. This is lovely chat that you have with Paul where he was talking about getting the Brits Lifetime Achievement Award and, and an offer the CBE, which he turned down as well at the same time. Right? And the uh, quote was, he said that he got to the point where he felt, felt oddly free to do whatever the fuck I wanted, he said, um, <laughs> to, to you, which I thought was lovely. And I think this was, this, so this was off the back of, as is now, the next album was 22 Dreams. And, and we'll talk about the solo years probably in a sec, but I think that quote kind of sums up everything about his entire career in a way, because actually I feel like he's always kind of felt that. It always seems like actually he's doing some music to please himself and then if the fans like it that's great as well because the style council and splitting the jam and it'd be lovely to hear how you how you found out about the jam split i mean that's very much against everything the fans would have wanted obviously and the style council at times he was messing with the fans and doing what you know exactly what he wanted to do so it's always been the case i think we all have our friends who have not let go of the jam yet <laughs> and the message boards are full of them and i love them because they are you know, the true fans. And he, for a long time, not all that long ago, I think saw them with a lot of disdain in many ways, even if they made up, you know, a third or more of his audience. There were a couple of documentaries done. There was one sort of career spanning, which I think was called Into Tomorrow. And then About the Young Idea came pretty soon after that. And I think he came to terms with that legacy in many ways after that. His sister, is a good conduit to the fandom. Dan, who did the Somerset House thing, and you know, all those things. I think he's realized there's something there 
that is sort of undeniable that he should be grateful for. I think Paul was always sort of moving forward. So, and now I'm psychoanalyzing him, moving forward at such a rapid rate. He was always one of these guys who, who would not look back. And, and a lot of artists are that way. I don't like to sort of look back at things I've done in the past. People bring up songs of mine from a long time ago. And it's like, yeah. And he and I did have a conversation. You know, I remember when Joe Strummer died, uh, my band, because we, we knew him, got asked to do this tribute to him at CBGB's when The Clash were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And we hadn't played together since 85. So this is like 2002 or so. Wow. And we played a couple of Clash songs and we played a couple of our songs. And I remember saying to Paul, I know what you mean now. I was playing these songs that I had written when I was 17 or 18 years old. And they were all, they felt bad. You know, they, I didn't connect with them in any mm. meaningful way. And so... You know, there's a couple of songs that I think he he rates, but there's a lot that, you know, I don't think he could play with any convincingly, yeah. you know? And I think the thing about him is he has to own it. He's not going to go through the motions, is he? And I but, in, I've had forgotten the question, but I think <laughs> in answer to your question, <laughs> in answer to your question, you know, the best artists, the people that we love the most, the Dylans and the Lennons and the Wellers and, you know, Tom Petty for that matter, they don't care what we want from them. There's ego in what they do. They, they want to sell records and they want to be at the toppermost or the poppermost. But they also balance that with a big helping of I don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really important because it wouldn't have led him to. I mean, I think As Is Now is a really good record, but for whatever reason, it didn't connect. And so when he threw off the sort of expectations of, you know, because there's there's a lot of jam-ish sounding music on As Is Now, played with a, a different band, obviously, you know, a band that maybe didn't have the edge that the jam had. And no disrespect to all those guys who were many, many of them friends of mine. He was older. They were all older. It wasn't, it wasn't 1978. So to throw that off and put out a record that was a hodgepodge, this sort of white album-esque thing, that was all over the place with 22 Dreams and have it be such a roaring success, not just among the critics who he really doesn't care. I'm lucky there's a couple of journalists that he doesn't sort of think of as journalists. Although if you ask him a question he doesn't want to answer, then all of a sudden you become a journalist. So that's, you know, it's a fine <laughs> line, but by the, same, by the same token, you know, to have the public embrace it, have it be a massive success and have people from Every aspect of his past, you know, fans of the jam find something in that record. Fans of the Style Council find something in that record. Britpop fans love the kind of, you know, the, th the stuff with um, Gammon and Noel. And, you know, there's like, there was a lot there. Remy's not, you know, there's a lot of people on that record. Mm -hmm. And without being contrived, there's a vibe to it that pulls you in. I mean, I, it's, it's a remarkable album. Um, and, and a gutsy record. But I think that's, again, it reminded him that when he doesn't do what's expected, he's not just at his best, but people will find it and embrace it. You mentioned documentaries, and I know that you, you've done a fabulous article, which I'll share with the podcast, around reappraising the Style Council. This was for Rockseller magazine when the Long Hot Summers documentary came out that Bax and uh, Lee Cogswell had made that we, we talked to on the, about the podcast. And obviously, you are, you're still a super fan for the Style Council. They're still a huge part of your life. Even I'm guessing the Disregarded House album was big on your radar because you love these guys so much. Yeah, but this Promised Land's a great song. Yeah. I'd go to the grave fighting about Promised Land. That's a great <laughs> record. And it was it was funny because I didn't hear that record until the 90s. And, by, and Mick and I talked about this, that not to name drop, but how by the time I heard it, by the time it got circulated, it was very out of step. It had missed the mark by yeah. it, it had been ahead of the curve. And then yeah. all of a sudden it was behind the curve. And when the box set came out, which was like 98 or so, the Style Council felt very off the radar. And I pulled out, it's right there. I pulled out the box set, you know, when I knew they were making the film and I, I knew I wanted to write about it. And, you know, a lot of these pieces I do, editors here in America, they don't care. I do it because I love it. I, you know, I wanted to help Bax and Lee, but I also wanted to tell that story and talk to those people. You know, it's like when I did articles with Rick and, and Bruce and certainly Paul, but I got to talk to everybody in the Style Council. What's better than that? you know, as a fan and have them, you know, Mick and I became friendly. We had met many years ago, but we, we became friendly 
and he's going to do a session for my record, you know, the record I'm working on. That blows my mind, you know? <laughs> it's bet, like, you know, because he's Mick Talbot. I mean, if he hadn't been in, if he'd just been in the Martin Parkins, that was cool enough for me. So, when, yeah, super fan. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that must have been great having a chat with and DC Lee, who again has not really done talks. any, yeah, doesn't talk about anything and, you know, fingers crossed for the podcast. But, um, Absolutely. but that must have been, I mean, as a fan, just having those conversations and then being able to write about it and find that people are reading what you're writing about is there, everything's there for that, isn't it? Yeah, because that, that story did incredibly well, which is really nice. You know, I'll, I'll tell you the, the funny thing about it. Paul, um, I just sort of tacked on a couple of Style Council questions when we talked about on Sunset. You can see from the interview, he just gave me a couple of one-liners that because I knew it was coming, it hadn't been announced yet, but I knew it was happening. He knew I knew it was happening. He knew what I was doing. I prefaced it, but he didn't really want to talk about that. We were talking about on Sunset and, you know, we were both, it was early days of lockdown. You know, so it was, I think it was via Zoom. It was, you know, it's just weird. He's, <laughs> when you're not sitting in front of him, he, he can disengage really easily. You start talking about something from 40 years ago, he disengaged yeah. pretty quickly. <laughs> so, so he didn't give me much. But when I was talking to Whitey and, and, and DC was really engaged because she doesn't talk about it very much. But Mick especially, I had the records right here. I was going through them one by one. And I was remembering those moments along with them. You can tell, like you, I have this wealth of knowledge, this crazy OCD knowledge about those bands that they really appreciate when you come to the table as knowledgeable, but you're able to put the super fandom to the side. You want to get into what was happening in that moment, what created those records, those shows, those, you know, how are you feeling? How did it change your life or not? You know, there's a great, a great story I tell many times about, I've interviewed Jimmy Page many, many times. And the first time I interviewed him, it was sort of by accident. I, you know, they had extra time and I got called back to interview him. It was in his hotel room. We were talking about Zeppelin bootlegs. And I said to him, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a Zeppelin fan. You know, I grew up with them. My brother was a huge Zeppelin fan. We had the eight tracks, but they weren't my band. I'm, I'm, if anything, I'm more a Yardbirds fan. But we were talking really seriously about bootlegs. And he said, well, just out of curiosity, what bootlegs do you have? And I said, well, I have a lot. And he said, well, like how many? And I knew because in getting ready for the interview, I ha have on a hard drive, I knew I had 256. And he said, there's not even 256 bootlegs. And I said, look, whether or not you're my band, you're Led Zeppelin. Not just as a journalist, but as a fan and a musician, I want to know what made you tick. I want to know how you found those sounds and what took you on the avenues. You he was fascinated by that. And so the next time he came to town, they called me. And we're like, do you want to interview Jimmy? We had, we developed this rapport where he knew I wasn't going to like slobber over him, but that I really knew his career and what had driven him mm. to, to the choices he made. We had some really fun conversations. It was the same way with Mick. Mick knew he was talking to somebody. First of all, I think it blew his mind that it was an American who knew that much about the Style Council. And, and also, you know, I mean, he knew I knew. Bax and, and, and Paul. And, you know, that always helps. It creates a different dynamic. But when you come to the table with a love of it, you, he knew I wasn't going to make them look bad. I had no interest in writing a kitschy piece about, oh, the style council are back. It was going to be done with love and respect. And I think that's all any musician wants. And they're, they're willing to put it out there because the stuff he said to me off the record, I'll go to the grave with. And there were a couple of things that we talked about that I, I think I texted or emailed him later and said, do you mind if I add that? Because this is really cool. It's a little bit contrary, but do you need And he was, yeah, that's, 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 thanks for asking. You know, so um, that might've been, D I, I can't remember, it might've been Whitey, but <laughs> anyway, it's all a blur. You, <laughs> fans are going to look at this and go, how can he not remember which one said the you know, <laughs> contrary thing? I'm now immediately after this um, if this chat, I'm going to dig into my hard drive to see how many Paul Weller Style Council jam bootlegs oh, I have. <laughs> it's insane. I mean, if I have a separate drive with like a four terab terabyte drive that archives the stuff that's in iTunes and there's maybe half a dozen bands on that. The Zeppelin isn't even on that. It's like it's the Clash and the Jam and Paul and the Style Council and the Beatles and the solo stuff and the Who and, and the Small Faces, you know, like the biggies. And I would bet I, you know, I probably have, and these are MP3s, uh, most of them, there's some flack and stuff, but I'm looking at it and I'm thinking there's, there's probably 
at least a terabyte of <laughs> Weller related. That's ridiculous. I mean, I don't know how much music that is, but it's thousands and thousands of songs, more than I'll ever listen to in, in my lifetime. And I have every version of every record on these shelves around here. And the, the cool thing is, you know, my Ahmad Khans, my import Ahmad Khans that I bought at a record store, might have stolen it, in, in <laughs> 80 or 81 from, you know, this record store in Connecticut where I grew up is signed. Wow. You know, I don't ask for signatures from very many people. I just don't care. It just doesn't move me all that much. But that those three guys touched that record to me. You know, that's it's really important to me. I, you know, I've known Paul a long time now. And when when Saturn's Pattern came out, I think the the guy from the record company, when I showed up to interview him, gave me the black one, the box of that. And I had him sign it. And he's a little weird when you, you know, you've known him for like 30 years and you're like, hey, can you sign this? It's, it's an awkward yeah. moment, but I'm glad I did it because he's, you know, it's meaningful to me. You know, even even if I have everybody's phone number, it doesn't it's not the same. You know, you're still there's still fandom when you walk away. You mentioned, I think this might have been before we started recording, we were talking about the Style Council and the early... Yeah, for folks at home, there was more. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Um, So Weller, when he comes back, the Style Council are no more. He's back solo. You saw them before that first album, the first solo album came out. I did. There wasn't even a record out. So it was a weird gig. Now I've mixed up. It's a very long time ago. I'd have to look at the chronology I don't remember if it was the new Ritz, old Ritz, Irving Plaza. You know, they did, he, he came probably five or six times in a very short period. They were trying to build something. And of course, I have them all, you know, on my heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want to say that one was the Ritz, but I, there could have been an earlier gig at Irving Plaza. I don't remember. Anyway, you know, the set list was weird. It was like some style council tunes some jam tunes that were sort of reinvented, you know, man from corner shop and things like that, that were a little jazzier feel to them. Strange museum was on the set list. I don't think he did any jam hits. Like I don't remember him doing town called malice or he might've done precious. You know, I'm trying to remember it was, was, you know, it's a very long time ago. This is like 90, 91, maybe 91. I'm, I'm guessing. So, and it was a little bit ramshackle, you know, I mean, he didn't have the new look down. He had, uh, he was playing some of those, he had a Strat, which is really unusual for Paul to be playing a Strat. Went out and got a Strat right away. Like, (laughs) hated it. I'm like, this is not a guitar for me, you know? And it didn't have any edge to it. The songs were there. He was obviously great. But you could tell there was something very tentative about it. And, you know, part of that was, these were not sold out gigs in New York city. He's, he's got a name, you know, I mean, he, he can fill, fill a place and maybe they were sellers, but they didn't feel like, you know, I remember him coming a couple of years later when Britpop was sort of ascending and, you know, Wildwood had come out, whatever. And everybody had Wildwood, everybody of a certain age here in America, even if they weren't Paul Weller fans, that was a record that, that many people had the import and Stanley road too was, was a, a big record within a certain age group here. But yeah, that that band, you know, I remember it. It was exciting to see him in person. And it was funny because I started to, I met John, John Weller, who was exactly what you wanted him to be. You know, I mean, he was like larger than life. So part of it is my memory of it seeing Paul and it, that being incredibly exciting. And part of it was like, you know, it, it wasn't there yet because subsequently, you know, I, I got very lucky that uh, about two years later, right on the cusp of, I think, uh, Wildwood coming out, I was working with Pete Townsend, was producing some demos for me. And I had a manager at the time who I tasked with, I want to open for Paul Weller. And so I, I got a call, you know, it was different in those days. There was no email or anything. I, I somehow ended up at a gig of his in in Providence, Rhode Island. And Kenny Wheeler, maybe it was John, said to me, this is where we're staying. Meet us at the hotel. You should have a drink with Paul because he needs to like you, I guess, you know. Mm-hmm. And we had this sort of drunken evening. And it was me. It was remarkable. It was me. And, and oddly enough, the bass player from my band, the Mindless Thinkers from the mid 80s, who were like hugely, we were a three-piece, hugely jammed 
inspired. And this guy was like beside himself that we were having drinks with Paul. And Paul was, you know, very much what he was at that time, which was a, a, an angry, not so young man. You know, he was he was very prickly and really kind of like pushing my buttons to see if he could bait me, but also like if it was real, if I actually love the who, if I actually love the small faces, if I, you know, if our tastes align and if our, and then a couple of months later, it was all within 93, I think I ended up because I was working with Pete in London and I got a, again, a phone call at my hotel. It was so crazy back then. How we, how did we even get to gigs? Yeah. Yeah. From, we'll do from, it, do the anything. Office, <laughs> from the office saying, would you like to see, you know, would you like to come to the gig at the dome in Brighton? And I'm thinking, mod heaven, <laughs> you know, like, and got on the train and we were there like hours and hours early, you know, we were probably there before the band. And it was, you know, that was a really incredible gig because it was in England, in Brighton, at the Dome, with that sort of classic early lineup on the Wildwood tour when, when he was just, you know, he could do no wrong. Even within the British press, he was like, everything was a number one and he was sort of back you know, as this kind of monumental guy in British music, that gig, we had like front center seats and it was, it just was something else. I mean, it just really, it really blew me away. I'm trying to remember who was on bass, if Damon was on bass yet, or if it was still Camilla. I think it was Damon by that time in 93, okay. but it was, you know, Craddock was on guitar yeah, and, and Whitey, obviously. I think Helen Turner was on keyboards. I'd, I'd, I'd have to really, there, you know, it's not like w w with our iPhones, there was no, there's no pictures, <laughs> you know, it just sort of <laughs> happened and then it went away and you were like, well, that was a great gig, but there was a fire to it. And he played hung up and it was like, you know, I've always thought that was him trying to ride a tin soldier or something. It's just such a, you know, I just loved that. You know, it's like, oh my God, I'm, it was heads in that gig. Unlike the other one, which is a little bit, it was jazzier. You know, it has sort of a jazzier vibe to it. And that sounds. Did you, you just wind me up and I'll just oh, tell no, you're Weller's I it, story? I love it, man. <laughs> we haven't the... even gotten to any of the interviews. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I mean, that, that sound is constantly changing, even from Stanley Road to Heavy Soul is is a is a real shift change, let alone everything that comes next. And we were talking before the podcast, we were talking about Illumination, how much we, were, we, yeah. we kind of enjoyed that album. And then to, through to as is now the covers album, Studio 150s, 22 Dreams, everything seems an evolution. And I know that you have had a sneak preview of Fat Pop in the sense that you've been sent some stuff, right? I've been sent some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> when is this going to air? I got to be a little bit careful. It is once again, completely different than, than before. Um, it has, you know, I loved on sunset and I loved that it had this grand kind of elegic, you know, it was this softer sun kissed pop soul vibe to it. And there's moments of that, no doubt there always are in, in Paul's work, but this is more angular, you know, it has a little more, a little more fuzz on the guitars and the keyboards and, a little more to my ears of a cut and paste vibe, you know, to some of the songs, which he did in, you know, Sonic Kicks and, and, yeah. and those records. The best way I could equate it is it's sort of like the best moments of the last five or so records. If you sort of look at everything Sonic Kicks to now, not in a retread way, but like, I like that idea, but I didn't perfect it. Let me try again because I learned something from that experience, which is what great artists do. I'm not rewriting, you know, that's entertainment. I'm going to take it in a completely different direction with a completely different arrangement and do it for 2021. And, you know, also I think, you know, I know Paul works really quickly. He obviously has his own studio there and has a, a band he can really rely on. It feels like maybe they took a little more time with the arrangements. I mean, obviously, On Sunset ha is, is gorgeous and has these great arrangements and certainly true meanings. You know, it, it, that, that, that was a whole other animal. It just feels like there's, there's twists and turns. What's the opening track on, on Sunset that's like long and crazy? Mirable. Mirable. Thank you for the, for the, <laughs> the Pearl Jam thing. <laughs> that felt very arranged. And that had come out of the sessions from the previous record. And sort of pointed to a, a new direction, as they'd say in Hard Day's Night. And I think it has more moments of that, where they had maybe a sort of straight-ish song, pop-ish song, and thought, well, what if we take this right turn in the middle? 
and just, you know, go off in this direction and drop the drums out and put in some keyboards. And, you know, what if we do that? You know, and, and that's not to say, you know, there, I, I just listened to it again before we started, just so it would be fresh. You know, the songs are there. But I think what's, what's interesting to me is, you know, they always say, well, the best songs are the ones you can sit down and play on an acoustic guitar. I'm not sure you could do that with any of these because they're arranged, they're complex. There are moments that like uh, the last track, which is really fresh in my head right now, is just this gorgeous, you know, kind of lush ballad. There's an unusual nature to all of them that I, I think if you've made however many records he's made at this point, it sounds like he's trying to entertain himself. Like, well, I don't want to just do a four minute song. I want to, what can I throw at this hmm. to keep it interesting and that for us as listeners who know all of his stuff inside and out it's like ooh, that was surprising i mean i was i was walking around the apartment i was having my coffee and you know doing whatever before we started listening to the record and i've only heard it at this point like three times which everybody can add their mv right now <laughs> uh and and I, you know, I've only had it a day, so it's hard, but I kept coming back into the room and standing in front of the stereo, which is, that's cool for somebody who's been doing it this long to engage you. It's mm. not passive listening. You know, I was coming in and going, oh, that was pretty cool. A lot of it is, you know, guitar sounds that are familiar or parts that are familiar or songs that feel instantly familiar. And then it takes that then it shifts and then it takes that turn. And, and it is, again, I, by, by no means are they retreads. You know, they're, they're new ideas. It's just that there's, we're so familiar with his voice and his style. It's hard, you know, to not think, oh, this feels like Paul Weller. And then it doesn't. And that's what I really, that's what I really love. About. I keep expecting there to be an album which comes along and you, and you, hit, I listen to it and go, Oh, that's not for me. That one does. Oh, oh, this doesn't work. This is not right. When is that going to come? And it never has. It never has. The, the office emailed me earlier this week and said, oh, you know, Thursday or Friday, you'll have a Thursday or Friday. We're just uploading the tracks and blah, blah, blah. Great. And there, there's always a moment of dread hmm. because I have, I have Paul, unlike sort of any other artist, they've put out, most people have put out that I love, have put out duds, hmm. like true duds. And I'm open about them being duds. You know, when, you know, there are, there are artists that I'm friendly with that I'll be like, yeah, it wasn't for me, you know, or not even wasn't for me. I just don't rate it, you know? Yeah. yeah. So there's always a moment of, oh, fuck, what if I don't, you know, he's making a chamber music record, you know, his true meetings or whatever, you know, orchestrated yeah. record, or he's going to do gigs at the Royal Festival Hall, or this might not work. And it works. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing about it, he, he's so disciplined in his approach to music. It is so important to him. I mean, you know, we're here talking about the minutia. The thing that I love about especially Noel and Paul in having had many conversations with both of them on and off the record is they, they're real fans. I remember I got a, I'm trying to remember that. The, the record is this really obscure record that came out. I was in a record store in the East Village and, and it was a compilation of like weird 45s soul stuff. I have to look it up and, and send you the title afterward or I could look at my phone if you want to take a minute. But and I, I bought it because the guy had it on. I'm like, take that down. I'm, I'm going to he only had one copy. I'm like, I'm going to buy that record. And I loved it so much. I thought to myself, I'll be able to find Paul was in town like a week later. I gave him the record, you know, and like a year later, he was out at coffee with a friend of mine, Earl Slick, the guitar player was in my band too. They, mm -hmm. they, you know, he plays with Matlock and he lives in Maida Vale near Paul. And they were having, and he was like, tell Jeff, thank you for that record. He was like a year later or maybe two, you know, he'd finally gotten to, but he, you know, he loves, he's a fan of finding new sounds, finding new artists. And you could talk about Strawberry Fields forever with him, but you know, a little bit of it is, are you a journalist asking me about my favorite Beatles? So, you know, it's like, it, there's a little bit of that. Whereas if you engage him about something, you know, King Tubby or something really, you know, a little bit off the mark, he gets really engaged because his collection is, I mean, if I flip this around and we look at the walls of records here, I'm sure it's like, you know, it's that great picture of when he was doing the vinyl class or um, the, the BBC show. Yeah. Vinyl uh, classics. Yeah. Vinyl classics where he's, you know, sitting with the dance set and he's got the records behind him and whatever. 
I don't know if that's his house, but that's how I imagine him, you know, because he'll he'll talk about records and he's got like when he was in town, I got a text or whatever it was, you know, meet us over at the at the thing. And he and I think Andy Crofts had been out record shopping in my neighborhood. And I'm like, oh, we should have texted you because we were at that record store that I got him that record. So he's always digging in the bins. And I think that's why, you know, he's not just listening to, I mean, I know there's a lot of guys out there who will watch this and I get the hate mail. So I know they want to punch me in the face. You know, they would love for him to still be listening day and night to the small faces and, and my generation. He doesn't. That doesn't mean he doesn't love them. They're they're he's like us. They're part of his DNA, but he wants to find, you know, what inspired them or what will inspire me. You had a great chat with him during lockdown about on sunset, which I enjoyed. And one of the things that I, I thought was it was either that or the true meanings conversation, because you've had a lot of conversations with Paul, like you said. And one of the things he was talking about was digging it. You talk about digging out new music and, and finding talented people to work with. And there was a bit he talks about where he was talking about the musicians that he surrounds himself with. And particularly at that point, he was talking about Hannah Peel and about um, Stan or Jan, I don't know which one it is, um, his engineer producer. He surrounds himself with really good people to work with. And he seems to be somebody who, who loves collaborating. I was talking to Neil Jones from the Stone Foundation and collaboration is a big thing for him. He loves working with talented people. You're much the same. So the song that you brought out a song October last year in lockdown as well, where you worked with Ben Gordiella. I think is how you pronounce it, who's well as percussion, sometime drummer, was on your song. You worked with Duff from Guns N' Roses. Earl Slick, you mentioned a, a little while ago, who, who guitarist for Lennon Bowie. So you quite like surrounding yourself with talented people too, right? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing I've learned from working with, you know, I played with Bowie's last band. I, when they toured without him, I, I was able to do some gigs with them. And I've known Slick now. And I worked first with him and Carlos Alomar about 2009 or 10. Um, and I had always been in bands, you know, collaborative unit bands. And when I did this stuff with Pete Townsend, I essentially used his band. It was like Mark Brzezicki and his brother and Josh Phillips Gorse. They were already kind of a unit. They had a sound. It sounded like Psychoderelic. I didn't like it, nor did Pete, quite frankly. <laughs> another story for another time. But what I learned in the early part of my solo career was when you find the right person for the job, they know how to do that. You just mm. let them do that. You know, Paul isn't going to bother himself, and he's told me this, with learning Pro Tools. That's what stands for. Stands a whiz. I have an engineer who that's what he does. You know, he, he can put anything anywhere and make it sound exactly the way, you know, I want it. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have a say in, you know, a lot of times, like, we did horn parts on a song and the tunings were weird, which is, you know, a problem for me, but also the arrangement that the horn guy did wasn't exactly what I wanted. We were able to move things around to make it suit my vision. So you always have a, as the artist, you always have a hand in it, but you know, part of it is, look, we had heartbreak. Ben played to an acoustic guitar and a click track, sent it to me and said, what do you think of this? And I said, Oh, what about this? You know, to, to sort of build it progressively. And then I sent it to, to Jordan Summers, who's the keyboard player for the Wallflowers. And he had a keyboard. So for a long time, it was just that. And then Lee Harris from Nick Mason's band added some guitar in it. He actually played the Michael Brecker from Steely Dan's lap steel on it. So, you know, <laughs> that meant nothing to me, but it meant, you know, it meant something to him. And, and it's a cool, it's cool. He bought it at auction. And then Slick added his part. And it was pretty clear what the record sounded like. And it was going to be a template for the album because I was writing sort of in that style and it needed bass. And I'm a bass player. I mean, that's, you know, what I do. Andy Cross is a buddy of mine. And, and there's plenty of other bass players that I know. I was moaning to uh, Duff as a pal of mine from, from way back in the 90s when we were all bad people. Uh, and we had, we had, re, we, had we, did a, we did a class tribute gig in L.A. about a year ago in the before times and reconnected. And, you know, so we were talking. I don't remember exactly why. And I was just bitching about, you know, session, doing sessions remotely. You know, mm -hmm. it's hard. And he said, oh, I'll do the bass. And I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, Duff on my record and whatever. And I sent it to him and I thought to myself, sweet child of mine isn't really heartbreak, you know. But, you know, he's a great player. And he didn't hear Guns N' Roses or whatever. He's a punk rock lover in it. He knew what I was trying to accomplish, and he's a great player. So he played something that really elevated and suited the tune. And I got it back, and I was knocked out by what he did. 
It's also cool that he played on my track and yeah. it doesn't <laughs> sound like him. You know, I, that's what I love about it. So I think the thing I've learned, and, and this is going back to the Bowie connection, is Mike Garson has said to me a couple of times, and Slick as well, and Mark Platty, these are all guys from his bands who, who I'm friends with, have said he, he was almost like a casting director. He knew who to get, how to get the right person for the right job, and then to let them do that job. And that didn't mean he didn't direct you a little bit. That didn't mean he didn't have a say in what you were doing. But it was very much, you're the keyboard player. I can bang out some chords, but you're the keyboard player. I'm going to let you do that. And that's how magic happens. So mm -hmm. I think when Paul brings in, you know, he could certainly do anything on guitar, but he has Steve Craddock there, first of all, because they obviously have a remarkable connection, but also because Steve brings something else to the table. He just does. He can do delicate in a way. Paul doesn't really do delicate. He can do, you know, he has a lot of tools in his shed. And so I'm going to bet, I've never asked Steve, but I could certainly do it. He's on the new record we're making as well. Like I'm going to name drop, you know, it's like, it's great. I'm going to bet Paul doesn't say, this is exactly what I want you to do on this song. I'm going to bet he, you know, he goes in there yeah. and he might say, I'll oh, do that again, or develop that a little bit, or, or maybe not. You know, I mean, we're all doing things. I know they've been to Black Barn quite a bit, but I know they've also been working, you know, on their own. I mean, Ben did my drums. He's now done drums on, I think, a dozen tracks for me in his bedroom. <laughs> right. He's like, well, I got to take the drums down because they're really in the way of my wife. Is, Are we done for a while? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll have some more songs and I'll take it. It's hilarious. You know, everybody's doing the, you know, doing the best we can. That's brilliant. I love it. Um, this has been so great. Um, I've got a couple of final questions for you, Jeff. Um, one is you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be the jam, the style council or solo. Which one is it? Wow. Good God. Um, that's an impossible task. <laughs> I'm cycling through, you know, a thousand songs right now. You know what? I, I will. I'll pick one. I'll pick, I'll pick, um, I'll pick Eaton Rifles oh. because it's a song. I've talked to him about that song a few times. It's one of the few from the early days that he will still play convincingly. I was going to pick Butterfly Collector uh, or Tales from the Riverbank, by the way, because it's just such gorgeous songs. Yeah. But I'll pick Eaton Rifles because it's so Paul Weller in a nutshell. And it reminds me of discovering. Him. It's a song that, I mean, it was, on the first record I ever heard. So, so there's that, but, you know, we've talked about it, you know, there was a whole thing 10 years ago when David Cameron said it was his favorite <laughs> the Paul Weller jam song, which is just so ludicrous in so <laughs> yeah. many ways. And Paul will get really angry about when you talk to him about that. And, and it's, it's come up since, you know, he played, I love that he played it with Bruce at the Albert Hall. What was it? 10 years ago or so. I was there. It was fabulous. Yeah. You know, it's just such a remarkable thing, but it's one of those songs that I think he doesn't feel embarrassed to play now. Um, it still feels resonant. There's a lot going on. It's not just kind of a punk era song. It's, it has that, but it also is so much more. And, and that's the great thing about his songs is they are one thing on paper you know, you can pull out the Suburban 100 and sort of look at them and be like, oh, there's some poetry going on here. This is pretty cool. Or you can take the records and they're just, you know, remarkable in so many ways. But then you can take it sort of all together with what we know about him. And it's like, it's a, you know, Eaton Rifles is a little window into Paul Weller's soul in a really meaningful way. And I think it still is. I think that's what's cool about it. It's, it's retained that magic. Yeah. And, and well, so, I pulled that out of my ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're such a pro, aren't you? Um, final question for you. And um, the whole point of this podcast, obviously, is to be able to have that interview with Paul, to be able to pop down to Black Barn for a cup of tea, have a chat about his career and what's coming next. What should I talk to him about? What one, as a man who's hung out with him, as a man who's interviewed him on many, many occasions, what should I ask him? Ask him about where he's going, not where he's been. And I will tell you why. W with any of, the, any of those guys who don't like to talk about the past, and Paul and Ringo, to a certain degree, are paramount. Like, don't ask Ringo about the Beatles. Don't ask Paul about the gym. It comes up. You know, his point of reference, just like for us, is earlier points in his career. How did he get to Fat Pop? 
by making 50 records. So if you talk to him about the new record, he, he may not reference the points in his career that you want him to, but follow him and you'll be just as enlightened and entertained as if you said, you know, you did the Chris Farley. You say, remember that time when you made all my cons? That was great. <laughs> that you're done. You are so fucking done with him when you do that. And everybody has said that. But look, I, I, I will say, you know, as a, Gary Crowley and I have laughed about this. We, we've both known him. He's known him much longer and better. But we've both interviewed him many times and also spent time with him, you know. And he can turn on a dime if he doesn't like the topic of conversation. He won't. I mean, I don't think now he will go with it with me now. But there was a point earlier where conversations ended abruptly. And in retrospect, I'm like, he just didn't like where it was going. He was done. And now that he knows me, and, and to a certain degree, I, I, I'm guessing, trust me, like when I started asking him, I forgot what I, it wasn't the Style Council stuff. There was something else I raised during the On Sunset where he, oh, I know what it was. The editor really wanted me to talk to him about, about his songwriting process. There's nothing that Paul hates more than to talk about how he wrote a song. I don't think he really knows. I think hard work, you know, he would be like, hard work. I just chipped away at it. You know, it's sort of, I put down some ideas and then it grew from that and through collaboration and production and, you know, it just sort of blossomed or didn't, you know, sometimes they don't. But if you say to him, you know, how did you write that song? Where were you at when you were, he really, he's like, I, he'll, he will say, I don't know. And that's his way of sort of shutting down the conversation. And when you're doing your job and you push, he gets really, you know, he gets his back up when you push him in a direction he doesn't want to go. You know, part of it is he's used to being able to end the conversation or have journalists, you know, because of his reputation, they're a little bit afraid of him. And I think the, the most important thing I can say to you is when you finally get there, and it, I have no doubt it will happen, you'll, you'll get to interview. He and I will, you know, certainly say nice things if it ever comes up. <laughs> <Bless you. laughs> don't be a fan. Don't be intimidated. You know, the I, I there are moments when I was talking to all the style council people, or or you know, Paul, or you know, other people, where there's a split second of like, oh wow, when they reference something that was meaningful to you. But I do tell this story pretty frequently that the only person I ever really sort of caught myself and went holy shit, was in the middle of an interview with Willie Nelson because he's so, I mean, he's so Willie Nelson, you know, <laughs> it's like, he's so larger than life. He has, it's a persona that is, it's like, it's performative as much as it is anything else. Whereas Paul, when you're talking to Paul, he will kick off the conversation like, you know, how are the kids and what's been going on and how slick and, you know, it's, it's, and that makes it, easier, certainly. But even early on, he he wants to, Ray Davis will spend 20 minutes and you're watching the clock and he will spend 20 minutes trying to decide if he wants to let you interview. Him. And once he's sort of figured out that you're okay, then he'll start. It's like, Paul does it much more quickly. A lot of those guys do the same thing. They want to know if you're going to come to the table with the, with the sort of Chris Farley, Paul McCartney scenario. And once they get over that, they loosen up, you know, pretty remarkably. So if you just, you know, come with smart questions and a lot of knowledge without wearing it on your sleeve, you'll be just fine, son. Oh, bless you. Well, that sounds like a, this is almost like a, um, a Rolling Stone magazine masterclass or something. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also hoping to a certain extent that everybody else on the podcast would have talked so much about the past that we've covered everything. So we just need to focus on the future. Jeff, this has been so enjoyable. I've loved every second of this. Man, I could talk for another hour and a half, couple of hours. It'd be lovely. But the kids need to get in their bath and all that. This has been great. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. No, I, you know, this was, as I said at the top, this this was really a thrill. It's, you know, I love Paul. I love every aspect of his career. I've certainly said and written things that he didn't like, but he knows I love him. And I think that's the key to any relationship. He does appreciate people who are honest, maybe not too honest, but, you know, no, that that I'm going to get a text about him. I guarantee you. <laughs> but but no, I, you know, I did this because, you know, I, I'm, I don't remember if I reached out to you, you reached out to me, but I wanted to do this. Yeah. There are podcasts that I'm that I listen to. I do a lot that, you know, I, I will listen before I do it, but I do it because I'm promoting something or, you know, somebody's a fan of mine or they're a fan of the artist that I've interviewed or whatever. This was the jam and the style council and certainly his solo years are so much a part of my really day-to-day -day existence. 
You know, it's like the way we think, the way we dress, the things we read, the artists we listen to, you know, all of that obviously comes from the Beatles and Dylan and, you know, all the, the big moments in the early part of rock and roll. I got to mention Little Richard and Chuck Berry. But for our generation, he is the sort of, you know, wellspring and touchstone that that has led us down so many artistic paths. I had a great conversation and Mick talked about this in the documentary about the cover of our favorite shop. I remember getting that. We didn't even talk about when I found out the style cat, the gym. No, I know. I <laughs> you know, it's a part two. And, and I don't mean to go on and on. I know your kids have to get a bath, but let them smell a little longer because that <laughs> record cover, it wasn't just that I was seeing things that I wanted to explore. I was seeing things that I already loved that they clearly loved too. You know, you're seeing Georgie Best and Lennon McCartney and all these other things, Clockwork Orange and whatever else. And you're like, I'm already on the train. I'm already part of the club. Right. So what are these other things going to get make me even cooler? You know, you're 16 or whatever it is. And you're trying to find your way. You're trying to find your people, your tribe. And that mod tribe, whether, you know, I get stick because I'm American and I'm not, you know, I got the, the skull rings and the whole thing. You know, it's not like a dyed in the wool mod. By the same token, if you have the ethos, if you're always looking forward, if you're informed by the past and you love style and you love a certain kind of music. And, you know, I've talked to Donnie Letts about those sort of early ska days that got co-opted by the skinhead movement and all that. But those early days of ska were so important. There's a whole there's a whole podcast. We could do a whole other thing about how Paul got to 1976-7. You know? I, would love that. I would love that. Yeah. There's, a, there's a future episode on this series. I'd love that. The, um, <laughs> we'll see um, how this one does. Yeah, this is. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of final questions for you. So one is, what is the hourly rate for therapy in the US now, just in case I need to send an invoice? <laughs> It's it's expensive. Oh, I'm doing all right. We don't have national health, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Fortunately, we have Obamacare, so there are some people that that do it for maybe two fifty or something, but it's <laughs> it's not cheap. And final one is, um, how do I get a password to the bootleg card drive? <laughs> it's not even password protected. Oh, it's just, but I I will tell you this: if there are things and and people who listen to. I always traded freely. And if there are things that people, I mean, don't ask me for the new record. Everybody's going to text me for the record. But there, you know, if there's something you're looking for or, um, you know, that that you've been on the hunt for that I have a silver disc of or a rip of or whatever, I freely trade what I have. I mean, it's a community. That's that's what's so great about, you know, we're we're mods and we're fans and we love Paul Weller and the jam, and the style council, but, but that community, I mean, I see we're all on the digest and all this other stuff. These are the same, I see the same names that I have seen since the internet began. <laughs> These are guys who came to see my band, the badge when we played in London or Brighton or Leeds or Leicester or Sheffield or, you know, wherever they would come up and say, I know you from splinters. Yeah. You know, and and we're friends. We're not just, you know, it's not just a name on my screen. We share something really that we're really passionate about that nobody can ever take away. If Paul never made another record. We have plenty of music to live the rest of our lives with. That's Maybe so I'll true. catch up on my bootlegs. Uh, there's a lot to dive into. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, man. All the best. It was great, Dan. I appreciate it. That was fabulous. My thanks once again to Jeff. I feel a part two coming on at some point. When we finished that, he said, um, we haven't even started diving into this yet. I could spend half an hour talking about Liza Radley alone. Oh, that was brilliant. Don't forget to share this episode on social media. Leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. It really does help us to find new listeners to the show. Get in touch. Make sure you contact us on Twitter. It's at Weller Fan Pod or on Facebook and Instagram. It's Paul Weller Fan Podcast. I'll see you next time.